Steve McQueen stars in the 1962 American war film movie called Hell is for Heroes. It was directed by Don Siegel, and it tells the story of a squad of U.S. soldiers from the 95th Infantry Division that spend about 48 hours along the Siegfried Line holding off an entire German company until reinforcements can arrive and reach them. The film has a great cast of characters. Steve McQueen is in one of the lead roles, and he plays Private John Reese. Bobby Darren plays a great part, and he's Private David Corby. Fess Parker, who you'll remember as Daniel Boone, and I really have trouble getting past that when I watch the movie because I want to see Daniel Boone with a fur skin cap. But he plays Sergeant Bill Pike. Harry Gardino plays the role of Sergeant Jim Larkin. And then there's Bob Newhart. He plays Private First Class James E. Driscoll. He plays a great role. He's a typist that gets just thrown into the action. And if you watch him, you'll immediately notice his style is identical to his comedy routines and to his show, Bob Newhart. He constantly stutters when he talks and has a very distinctive cadence to his delivery. James Coburn plays Corporal Frank Henshaw, and Nick Adams plays the role of Homer. Now, there's an odd thing about this film. The film abruptly ends without there being a real resolution to anything that goes on in the film. But this has caused it to gain kind of a cult following. You see, the film was over budget, and Paramount refused to provide any more film stock to the set. Mixed into the soundstage work and the stuff that was shot on location, they have stock footage that they use from the actual war itself. But having the film basically run out of money gave it its really abrupt ending. Now, most of the stuff was done on a soundstage, and maybe a little bit of it was done on some backlots, but the final battle scene was filmed on location in Northern California. The screenwriter, Robert Piroche, was originally set to direct the film, but after he had repeated clashes with star Steve McQueen, he was replaced by Don Siegel. The writer's script featured many blackly comedic scenes, but most of them were not filmed, as Siegel wanted to make the film more dramatic. Bob Newhart was terribly disappointed in this. He wanted some comedy in the film, and he did his best to get Siegel to kill his character off early, but Siegel refused to do that. The director didn't want to shoot the scene where Bob Newhart's character has a fake phone conversation with headquarters, and he did this to fool the Germans who were listening through a microphone that was planted in a U.S. bunker. The director felt that there was no place for this in the story. He was overruled by the studio. You see, Newhart at the time was a hugely popular stand-up comedian, and a major part of his act was having a one-sided telephone conversation. The studio told the director or basically ordered him to do that scene and their reasoning for having it done was to capitalize on Newhart's popularity. And Bob Newhart wrote all his own lines for that scene. During the filming, a lot of the temperatures reached about 117 during the day. So some of the day sequences were changed to night so the cast wouldn't collapse from heat exhaustion. During the production of the film, a number of the actors, including Steve McQueen and Fess Parker, frequently arrived on the set late and shot a number of scenes with little or no rehearsal and even without any makeup. Apparently, they were working on other film projects at the same time that they were shooting this one. Now, the role played by Steve McQueen, Reese, walks down the hall to report to his new outfit, and he passes some graffiti on the wall to his right. One of the phrases 
that's written there is the movie title. Now, the director, Don Siegel, once said that he would never make a war picture unless it was strongly anti-war. He stated that he felt like no side ever wins in war, and he thought how hypocritical warring nations are. He stated numerous times that war is senseless and futile, and he felt like the title of the film was true, that hell is for heroes. I guess the only problem with this is that sometimes war is necessary. Now, the censors wanted to limit the words damn and hell from the script. They considered them too outrageous to say. But Don Siegel insisted that they remain, and they finally did. Many of the cast was just terribly angry over the studio's budget restrictions. They really had a tight hold on this film, and this resulted in really phony-looking props malfunctioning firearms, and the same German soldier having to be killed three or four times. In the last battle scene, Steve McQueen can be seen experiencing multiple failures of firing his weapon. These malfunctions were due to problems with the blanks that they used in the gun. Now, in one of the scenes, Bobby Darren has a clip that shows him with a flamethrower, and that flamethrower didn't cut off when he released the trigger. A moment of panic then ensued that took over the cast and crew, but he ended up keeping his cool until the technical expert crimped the hose and made the flame stop. They used Roman candles to look like tracer bullets, and this is really obvious. If you watch the movie and just keep your eyes on the battle scenes, you can pick out numerous Roman candle shots that are fired through the course of many shots. At one point during the filming, one of these Roman candles curved and hit Nick Adams squarely in the back. Fess Parker happened to be right behind him at the time and grabbed him and threw him down on his back before he could get badly burned from it. Robert Peroche based the character of Homer, the Polish mascot of the squad, on an actual 17-year-old Polish displaced person that his unit in the war discovered hiding in the basement in Germany. Because they could not pronounce the young man's name, he and his fellow GIs dubbed him as Homer. As in the film, this real Homer wanted to become an American soldier. The group tried everything they could think of to get him inducted into the army, but they weren't successful at it. Eventually, Homer joined up with another platoon, and Peroche never saw him again. Now, the writer discovered this real incident upon which he based the entire screenplay entirely by chance. A few years after the war, he stopped at a gas station and started having a conversation with the attendant there. This attendant, like himself, had fought in Europe as an infantryman, and when that man learned that Peroche served in the 35th Division, he told him that his own unit was stretched incredibly thin after the 35th was pulled out of the line and shifted to defend against Germany's offense in the Battle of the Bulge. This story absolutely fascinated Peroche, and he initially thought about making a movie based on this subject in 1955. But he was unable to proceed on this until after the secret operation in question was declassified by the Pentagon in 1960. In an attempt to explain Steve McQueen's character, Director Don Siegel and writer Richard Carr originally planned for him to give a long speech to Sergeant Pike defending his actions after his failed attempt on the pillbox leads to two soldiers dying. But when put into practice, the speech came out really phony sounding and they did everything they could to rework it and made numerous attempts on this but they just couldn't get it to work. Ultimately, it was Steve McQueen's idea 
that Reese not have an explanation for what he did, so that when Pike asked him if he was right to stage the attack, all Reese was able to say is, how the hell do I know? Now let's talk about Steve McQueen in this movie. He was definitely problematic. He was reportedly furious with his agent for having induced him to sign on to this film and not securing the fee that he had been promised up front, and also for passing on another movie that he wanted to do. And people think that this might be one reason that he's angry through the film and has this detached, loner look through the entire picture. And it wasn't really just method acting that was taking hold. It's been said that a columnist visiting the set commented on Steve McQueen's temperament during the filming, and he made the comment that Steve McQueen seemed to be his own worst enemy. It seemed like he had little trouble fitting into this role because he didn't get along with anybody in this film. And by most accounts, playing this kind of guy wasn't a stretch for Steve McQueen. Time and time again during the production, McQueen got into the face of studio executives and the director, Don Siegel, and a bunch of the other cast members had problems and altercations with him. And when you watch this movie, you can just tell McQueen is not in a very good mood the whole time he's in it. This is not just good acting. This is a guy that doesn't like being where he's at. This isn't the first time we've heard this from people that have had to work with Steve McQueen. I find this movie an enjoyable 90 minutes. Take a look at it yourself. I think you might enjoy it. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll continue to chase the classics.